We're all set. And just a reminder that uh, Governor Baker did provide at the beginning of the coronavirus uh, crisis relief to public bodies like this commission uh, from the open meeting law so that we could convene remotely. And we have been um, exercising that rigorously uh, since the beginning in March. So we will be convening uh, virtually today. And should anything happen with our connection, please visit the um, M <clears throat> Mass Gaming Commission's website at massgaming.com. Today is Thursday, July 30th. It is 10.03 a.m. And today is public meeting number 314. We'll get started with minutes, please, Commissioner Stebbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Uh, my colleagues, you have in your packet the uh, meeting minutes from the June 18th, 2020 meeting. Um, thank you, as always, to Shar for her good work helping to pull those together. Uh, I would move their approval uh, subject to any corrections for typographical errors or any other non-material errors. If I could, before we do that, can I just um, make one recommended edit, or two, actually? Sure. Yeah. This was the meeting where I needed to step off for a chunk of it. So I just think that when I left and when I came back should be reflected in the minutes. So if we can add that I left the meeting at 11.15 and returned at 12.25, um, that would reflect accurately when I'm not participating. Okay. I was, I was going to make that recommended change too. And for the record, I want to point out that that day, uh, we also convened a later at 1045 because we did have really our sole technological uh, challenge where we were in two universes somehow. So that started late, which pushed off the planning for Commissioner O'Brien's attendance. And if I recall correctly, she needed to get to her fifth grader's graduation. That's so, right. Um, and, and it did throw off a, um, an important piece of the meeting. I know she had wanted to participate in that vote. So um, again, I wanted to reflect that as well. We can make those additions. And uh, I'm not sure we'll mention the fifth grade graduation, but we can put in uh, Commissioner O'Brien's <laughs> departure. It makes for a good Probably best note. if you don't, actually. <laughs> <laughs> a little footnote doesn't hurt, Shara. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, is, are there any further edits to the, the minutes? Yes, I, I have a, an edit, um, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, on, uh, on page 11. Okay. Um, at 2.33, where, uh, where I wrap up the discussion um, from Dr. Bolberg's presentation. In the middle of that um, sentence, uh, of that paragraph states that um, gamblers' propensity to gamble at anything versus discerning what game they're addicted to. And that's just uh, terminology that we don't really use. Um, okay. It is correct that the hypothesis earlier, just in the prior page, that problem gambling is more closely related to some forms of gambling formats was in fact what, what Dr. Wolver um, found but it's just not quite uh, uh, well reflected in that sentence as, 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 uh, as we discussed it. Do you have recommended language, um, Commissioner, or would you like to just work on that? Well, uh, just that the hypothesis earlier, where it says that um, problem gambling is indeed, appears to be more closely related to some, some formats of gambling than others. Um, should be reflected in that as part of that paragraph. Okay. But um, the notion of addiction is not one that, uh, it's not a terminology that the people at public health seem to be using these days. Okay, we can, uh, we can edit that section and, and uh, share it back with you. Excellent. Sounds good. Thank you. Any further edits or comments? It certainly was a busy meeting. Shara, thank you for your good work. Without further edits, we'll take a roll call vote. Um, do we have a second, Madam Actually, Chair? I'll, I will second that uh, motion. Thank you. Roll call vote, Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zunica? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. Thank you, I vote yes, 5-0 with those additional edits. Thank you so much.
Okay, and <clears throat> Interim Executive Director Wells, you are here. Yes, I had thought I would be still on another board meeting, uh, but I am here, but I am going to uh, turn over uh, the administrative update to first uh, Loretta Lilios and Alex Lightbaum for the casino and racing update, and then uh, Attorney Grossman for the legislative development update. So I'll start with Loretta. Sure, good, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, about three weeks have passed since the three licensees have, and there have been two weekends of operations since you were updated at the July 16th. Uh, commission uh, public meeting. Uh, as you know, gaming agent staff are continuing to monitor compliance with normal integrity of operations. They are also monitoring compliance with the reopening requirements related to uh, COVID uh, that the commission adopted uh, late last month. And those general areas of monitoring are around cleanliness, the implementation of the social distancing measures, uh, the compliance with the mask requirement and the related matter of limiting uh, beverages to those seated while gambling. For all the reports have been uh, very positive. Uh, there's been an all hands on deck approach for all three of the licensees with a high level of um, on the ground engagement from casino employees including management level on the casino floor uh, actively engaged in um, reminding guests, for instance, whose masks fall below the nose to pull them up, uh, reminding them uh, about the beverage requirement and so forth. And there's also been overall a high level of cooperation from guests uh, as well with few problems around health and safety measures. The number of instances where the gaming enforcement unit have had to become involved has been uh, limited, can, can be counted on one hand, um, and involve things like a patron causing a disturbance where uh, the mask or some other um, health uh, protocol have been part of the overall disturbance issue. But, you know, given, uh, given the numbers, uh, it's been, uh, very limited. And speaking of the numbers, uh, attendance at all three uh, properties uh, has stayed well within the formula uh, set by the commission. Uh, there are reports, is a report from the agents that at one of the end evenings, uh, distancing at queuing areas can be improved, uh, like uh, the, the example given to me was around elevators. Uh, that feedback was immediately shared with casino management. Uh, it was taken seriously um, in the process of doing more measures, and we'll be paying attention to that, um, to that this weekend. Um, uh, Plain Ridge uh, has increased the number of its gaming positions from the low 700s at reopening to the 780 range. Uh, there is widespread use of the plexiglass uh, barriers separating the machines across the floor. There have been no incidents in COVID measures uh, requiring GEU involvement. Uh, on the racing side, I will try to uh, address some of the uh, matters. I've been in communication with Dr. Laubaum, but she is here uh, for more detail if needed. Um, as you know, the simulcasting and live racing uh, have been uh, operational, including the Spirit of Massachusetts uh, uh, trot last Sunday uh, with outdoor and indoor uh, viewing areas. Uh, at last Sunday's event, uh, advanced ticketing was utilized as a, a planning measure. And the licensee had two Plainville police officers on site uh, for that event uh, with uh, appropriate social distancing signage, stanchions to separate uh, entry from uh, exit. Um, distancing markers were used on the floors inside. Uh, they apparently were uh, tried in the outdoor area, they were not effective, were not uh, sticking uh, well, were, you know, a tripping uh, hazard. Um, but the attendance level at approximately 250 uh, did allow for uh, distancing within the state. In the uh, test area, at the last meeting, you heard extensively from Dr. Lightbound around the issue of the pens um, and, you know, uh, 
going through uh, 100 pens a day because there are areas where uh, we determine our signatures still are the best uh, procedure, uh, but folks are, uh, according to Alex, getting much, uh, much better about bringing their own. So that is going well. Uh, on the back side, there has been good compliance with having and wearing uh, masks. Uh, Dr. Lightbaum is in ongoing discussions with Mr. O'Toole and with the horsemen about the proper coverage of the mask uh, over the nose and the mouth. Uh, personally, I have not seen the rating area for some time. Uh, I've blocked off an afternoon next week to uh, when there is live racing to go down and have a uh, first hand look so my uh, conversations with uh, with Alex will be more meaningful um, uh, after that. Uh, simulcasting at Raynham and Suffolk Downs uh, has been operational uh, and they uh, have been implementing uh, the measures around the masks and distancing, the signage and uh, compliance with the food and beverage restrictions. Again, their occupancy numbers have been within the numbers in their plans. Uh, the reports are that um, customers are understanding and cooperative about the protocols. We did hear uh, from Mr. Tuttle about one instance at Suffolk Downs where a guest wanted to order a beverage from the bar instead of uh, from his seat. Uh, management intervened. The guest was asked to leave, uh, and uh, which, which happened with no uh, further incident. Um, at uh, Suffolk Downs, um, there's a, uh, a plan to utilize additional space in the upstairs restaurant area, uh, which uh, was part of the uh, plan submitted uh, by them uh, to allow uh, more spreading out and to take advantage of the air conditioning uh, that's available there and not available outside. Uh, the uh, expectation is compliance with the governor's restaurant protocol calls. It's my understanding that the building code occupancy for that area is 600. It will be limited to 150 with the six foot spacing on um, the restaurant protocols and uh, limiting uh, groups to the numbers. Um, with respect to MGM, uh, they opened with a little over 900 gaming positions, 819 slots, and 90 table games. They have increased their slots to 865. Uh, they are relying more on distancing uh, for the slots rather than for the installation of the uh, plexi. Uh, plexi on the table games is being utilized as required. Um, and the agents have uh, monitoring have been monitoring the rules of the games. Um, in the context of Flexi and uh, that has been going well. Uh, they continue to use the Flexi dividers in the cage and the count room, utilizing every other cage position. There's uh, solid uh, good compliance masks as well. Um, at uh, Encore, they are maintaining their um, positions at uh, 2449. Uh, with their thermal cameras being utilized. Again, wide use of plexiglass uh, with the slots at on. There have been requests from uh, the two licensees with the table games to add dice games, both craft and roulette. Uh, we are working through those requests now. The uh, agents are working on understanding the prototypes for the use of plexi on the games, whether a seated option is viable and would enhance safety. They're also looking at the uh, question of uh, proximity issues, taking into account players and staff, uh, whether uh, the game can be played consistent with safety measures. Uh, looking at other jurisdictions, how they have handled the introduction or not of those games, and it's something that we expect you would evaluate substantively uh, at a later meeting uh, in August. Um, so, uh, those are my prepared remarks. If you have questions, I know we've got Bruce and Burke uh, here, um, and Alex is here uh, as well. Uh, Loretta, this, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Commissioner Cameron. I, yeah, no, I, I don't have a question, but that is really good report, really good news that people are complying and working together. Small issues are being addressed. Uh, being self-reported and then being addressed immediately um, 
that's I think it's just a really good report for uh, an opening that we were all very uh, hopeful would go smoothly. So thank you for that report. And thank you to the team for working collaboratively to make sure it's it's been a smooth uh, opening. Thank you, Loretta. Um, <clears throat> further uh, particular questions for Loretta and of course, Alex is available too with respect to horse racing to add in. I know we're gonna get further additional um, points from Alex, I believe, um, or, or, or not, Alex. Yes or no? You won't be adding in today? Okay. So, uh, Loretta um, covered everything. We tried to incorporate it in what she was speaking today. So I'm Excellent. here if there's any other questions. That's right. <clears throat> Anything further? I, um, I do wanna just acknowledge that we do, you know, we know that we'll be hearing about uh, the relicensing process for PPC in our next item, but we I want to acknowledge that we do have Jay Snowden, President, CEO, and Director of Penn National with us. Thank you, Jay. And we have um, President Lance George from PPC. Uh, I'll, I'll take this time right now to just echo what Commissioner Cameron uh, said is that we've been very, very appreciative of all three licensees' cooperation around the extensive work that was done to um, toward a safe, sustainable reopening, and, and your organization has been a, a great partner in that effort, uh, exhibiting the level of really collaboration, cooperation, and empathy that we need at this time. So thank you. We won't get into that so much in the next piece, but uh, Loretta's report today indicates that all those efforts are, are resulting in what we hope will be a continued trend. So thank you. Thanks, it's been a great partnership so far. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Commissioners um, O'Brien, Zuniga, Stevens on Loretta's uh, comprehensive report. All right. Uh, no, I, I appreciate it. I know we've been in touch um, as part of the working group. Um, I'm going to try to coordinate my visit Thursday down to PPC and racing with Loretta. So hopefully I'll be able to see some of this for myself on the ground on Thursday. Um, and I know that we have a meeting coming up in the next day or so to sort of see if there's anything else, sort of outliers or smaller issues to deal with in terms of uh, how we're reopening. But on the whole, it's been um, a really good process, I think, between the licensees and, um, and a good amount of compliance by the people attending, which I think is critical to this. And it's good to know that it's happening. Yeah, Madam Chair, I would just, um Echo some of Loretta's comments. I had the, the chance to visit both PPC and MGM last week. Um, you know, very impressed at PPC with the technology they're using to assess patrons as they come in and out in terms of their temperature. Uh, I would also um, throw in a, a word of thanks to our, our partners, the, the Harness Horsemen. I know the leadership of the Harness Horsemen have been working diligently with their members on the back stretch to make sure everybody is wearing the masks and uh, complying with the guidelines. So um, thank you to the Harness Horsemen in addition to our licensees. Um, got, can you hear me? I can hear you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, just to, to, um, to, to reiterate what, what has been said, I was also able to visit um, Ancor uh, Boston Harbor last week uh, and observed very much what uh, what Loretta is uh, reporting and, and others' impressions about uh, compliance, which is very positive and encouraging. Um, and look forward to these uh, ongoing reports because they are very important. Thank you, and we have to also extend our appreciation to uh, the, the lead uh, gaming agents. Um, we have um, Lewis and um, Lewis and Andrew and Angela have all been able to give the Restart Working Group extensive reports. We appreciate their vigilance, and we know that that team, the Bruce Van and Burke Haynes leadership, are really helping to be an extra set of eyes on not just all matters with respect to uh, gaming integrity, but also the the compliance with COVID-19, it takes a village and we appreciate that. And the reports have all been extensively positive. So thank you. 
Okay, then I think it, uh, we can move on to uh, item B. Is that correct, Loretta? That's or, right. Uh, Todd, um, we're all set in terms of your report. That's correct. I'm, I'm ready to go on the suitability piece uh, for the-, oh, the Yeah, but first we'll do, we'll do on Todd's uh, legislative update and then we'll move on to item three. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning to everybody. Um, I have a, a update as to some legislation that was pending that was passed and other points of interest that I thought I would uh, run through with everyone here today. Of course, welcome any comments or questions along the way. Uh, I'll start with just a number of uh, proposals relative to horse racing. Uh, the first is Chapter 106 of the Acts of 2020, also known as House 4817, an act uh, extending simulcast and horse racing authorization. It was actually enacted on June 30th. As uh, you're likely familiar, it effectively extended all of the applicable horse racing laws, including Chapters 128A uh, and 128C that were set to expire and extended them through July 31st, 2021. Notably for Raynham Park and the Wonderland entities, there's language in that extension uh, that provides that they shall remain licensed as Greyhound Racing Meeting licensees through that effective date. And similarly, as for Suffolk Downs, the language says that it shall remain licensed as a running horse racing meeting licensee through the effective date. So what that means essentially is that it allows all of those entities to continue simulcasting, but it precludes them from live uh, racing without commission approval. So that is uh, the so-called uh, racing extension law. Um, there are a couple others I thought I would just mention as well. There's uh, House 13 and Senate 101. These are the bills that would have created a new chapter 128D and provided the commission with clear and comprehensive authority over horse racing and simulcasting. I believe there are, there are some slight differences between the House and Senate versions, though they are largely similar. Uh, these were before the Joint Committee on Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure. But on June 7th, the committee reported that these bills ought not to pass. So they are uh, unlikely to uh, see any uh, affirmative action uh, as part of this session. There's a, a couple other horse racing bills uh, that I've been asked about in the past. I thought I would just mention uh, House 386 is a bill that would have adjusted the 9% assessment on Plainridge Park Casino's gross gaming revenue under section 55. So that instead of the whole amount going to the Racehorse Development Fund, only four and a half percent would go to the Racehorse Development Fund and four and a half percent would go to the Community Preservation Trust Fund. This was before the Joint Committee on Economic Development and Emerging Technologies, uh, which actually held a hearing on the bill in October of 2019. There was a study order placed on this bill in February of this year, and that is the last activity uh, that it has seen to date. There was also House 387, which uh, is a bill that would have required the comptroller to transfer up to $10 million each fiscal year at the request of the Secretary of Admi uh, for Administration and Finance from the Racehorse Development Fund to the Community Preservation Trust Fund. This was a bill that was before the Joint Committee on Economic Development and Emerging Technologies, which held a hearing in July of 2019 on this bill. And similar to the previous one, there was a study order placed on this bill in February of this year. And that is the last activity on that bill. Uh, the two bills that everyone is likely familiar with that are uh, presently um, in uh, seeing activity are House uh, 4879 and Senate 2842. Uh, the House bill is entitled an act enabling partnerships for growth. Essentially, it's an economic and capital development bill. Uh, notably, of course, it includes a section that would legalize sports wagering and place its regulation under the commission. Uh, there is also language in the House bill that would require the commission to submit a report to the legislature relative to the status of Region C. 
the House bill was passed on Tuesday uh, when it became House 4887 and it was sent over to the Senate. The bill is now before the Senate, um, though the Senate version of the bill is notably different in that it does not include any language relative to sports wagering. There have been a wide variety of amendments uh, proposed to the Senate bill, and I, I took a quick look at them this morning, um, and uh, I need to continue doing that uh, to see whether any of the amendments pertain to sports wagering or what have you. But this is certainly, needless to say, a very fluid and rapidly evolving matter. So we're monitoring uh, that situation very closely, of course. Um, the other uh, matter I just thought I would mention quickly is pertains to the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Uh, the United States House of Representatives uh, recently agreed by voice vote to an amendment uh, proposed by Representative Kennedy to a House Resolution 7608 uh, that would prohibit funds from being used by the Department of the Interior to rescind the decision to take lands of the uh, Mashpee Wampanoag tribe into federal trust or to revoke other associated actions. Um, the, the House Bill 7608 essentially provides generally for fiscal year 21 appropriations to the Department of State uh, for foreign operations and related programs, but it is notable that they did include uh, that piece related uh, to the tribe, which is relevant based upon uh, case law that recently came out remanding uh, the interior decision back to the interior to take further action. So we're of course closely monitoring uh, that piece of legislation very closely as well, and any uh, further regulatory action that's taken by the Department of the Interior. Those were uh, the pieces of legislation that I thought would be important to update uh, everybody on. I'm happy to take any questions, uh, if there are any. Really helpful, Todd. Do we have questions? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Todd, just a quick question for uh, to remind me, if uh, if a bill does not see passage during a, a two-year legislative session, it needs to be refiled in any new legislative session. Nothing gets carried over. I'm, I'm assuming into a new legislative session. That's yes. That's my understanding as to how it, the procedure. Thank you. I I have a question, uh, Todd. Yes, Commissioner. Um, the, back to uh, Massachusetts, um, on the Senate version of, um, of the bill relative to um, uh, sports wagering, uh, I, I, you, I believe you said uh, the Senate did not include it, but in, it included a report due to the, le to the legislature relative to Region C. Was that also part of the uh, House version? Is that, what is the likelihood that that will be um, you know, uh, enacted. So the, to, uh, thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. The, to clarify, the House version is the one that contains sports wagering and the Region C report. Uh, the Senate version, and I, again, I need to check the amendments to see whether this was captured, uh, but the last I checked, um, neither of those were included in the Senate version. Um, okay. So, Again, it's it's rapidly evolving. There have been amendments proposed. I just haven't had a chance to see whether they have action has been taken on them that would include sports wagering in the Senate version, but they would obviously have to be adopted and included. But with respect to the Regency study, we haven't seen that. But again, you haven't had a chance, and and it is very fluid. You needed to be here, so we appreciate the fact that you'll keep on monitoring that. Absolutely. Thanks. Other questions for Todd? Okay. Now, Loretta, I think we can move on. Oh, Todd, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And move on to item number four on the, the relicensure. Hey, thank you. As you say, I was really eager to uh, get to this item. So, um, <laughs> so thank well, you. My, my cue wasn't very helpful, Loretta. So here we are. 
So good, good morning again. And uh, for this item, uh, the IEB is presenting the results of the investigation into the suitability of Plain Ridge Park Casino, the category uh, two licensee. And we conducted this review in connection with the licensee's application to renew its license, which originally in June of 2015. And of course, the commission issued positive determination ability in connection with that phase one review back in 2013 and suitability is ongoing. We've been routinely monitoring. We've done uh, additional background reviews and you voted on individuals in the interim as they have newly joined the company. And you did a big review of uh, qualifiers about a year ago in connection with the a GLPI real estate uh, transfer. But we took a comprehensive look again in connection uh, with, this, uh, with this renewal. And I'm joined this morning by our in internal team um, of Trooper Tom Roger from the State Police, Monica Chang, uh, Supervisor of our Financial Investigations, Andrew Steffen, the Senior Supervising Gaming Agent who oversees uh, PC and Faye Yu, who's a financial investigator uh, in the IEB, and all are participating virtually in this meeting. And uh, Chair, I know you uh, already acknowledged uh, Lance George and uh, Jay Snowden, but also on this call, I would like to acknowledge uh, Lisa McKenney, the compliance manager from PPC, and uh, three other uh, uh, representatives from Penn National uh, Carl Sotosanti, General Counsel and uh, Corporate Secretary, Justin Sebastiano, uh, Senior VP of Finance and Treasurer, and Chris Soriano, the Chief of the Office. And the three of them are uh, in a, a conference room at uh, their headquarters, but uh, safely distanced. Uh, as there also is a representative from uh, Gaming and Leisure Properties, Inc. on the call, as you know, that uh, uh, is the real estate investment trust that serves as the landlord uh, for the real property in Plainville and the Plainville facility. And uh, that's Melissa Ferrillo, who's the director of housing and legal affairs on the call. You have a letter in your packet summarizing the uh, details and the results of the IEB investigation, uh, which again was a background review for suitability purposes. And, um, Faye is uh, going to take responsibility for sharing her screen. Uh, I think it might be helpful at um, uh, points to see the actual list of the uh, individuals and entities we're talking about. Uh, so as an initial step in our inquiry, we've worked with the Division of Licensing in a scoping exercise to make sure that we identified a comprehensive list of all of the individuals and entities uh, that would be required to submit to the process. And the scoping resulted in the designation of 22 individuals and seven entities as qualifiers uh, for the renewal license. 15 of the 22 individuals are before you today for suitability determinations, and they are depicted in the shaded areas of the letter. The remaining six qualifiers either were recently investigated and determined by you to be suitable or were very recently designated as qualifiers because of changes in the organization and their background reviews are still in process. Uh, some of those before you today, as I uh, previously said, were previously found suitable by you. Uh, either in the context of phase one suitability or when they joined the company. And we updated their background reviews based on a protocol that uh, the commission approved, including some areas of inquiry that we added to our Massachusetts supplement form that reflect our uh, increased experience in our role as regulators. Three members of the Penn National team are new to Massachusetts, so we conducted a full review of them. And they are Mr. Todd George, uh, Executive VP of Operations, uh, who is new to Massachusetts, but I uh, understand is Lance George's brother. Uh, Mr. Chris Rogers, Senior VP and Chief Strategy Officer, and Ms. Erin Chamberlain, VP of Regional uh, Operations. Uh, and then five of the individuals before you today are non-executive outside directors of GLPI, with GLPI itself being an entity qualifier for the licensee. 
as for the entities, in addition to the licensee itself, one of the seven entity qualifiers, Penn National, ultimate parent company of our licensee, is before you today for suitability determination. So I, I did want to note that we started this process uh, before the coronavirus pandemic, but a portion of this investigation was uh, continued and concluded during this challenging period. Uh, despite the challenges, we were able to uh, complete our established protocols with the only modification being the interview of the three new qualifiers or picked up in a virtual environment rather than face-to-face. -face. So I did want to recognize our team for uh, adapting and also recognize the team at PPC through uh, Lance and uh, Lisa. There was never any question that this process received priority treatment from them. And the same goes for the Penn National folks at a time when they have uh, had a lot of irons in the fire, to say the least. Uh, there was full cooperation and prompt responsiveness from them over the course of this, uh, this review. So we did perform our review for suitability under the criteria listed in the gaming law and regulations. We reviewed in particular for uh, integrity, honesty, good character, and reputation, financial stability, financial integrity, and financial background, business practices, and business ability to maintain a successful gaming establishment, history of compliance in this and other jurisdictions, litigation history, and criminal history, which uh, there was not. Uh, for the licensee and for each qualifier, we reviewed each application submission, requested and reviewed supplemental information, gathered information from a variety of government and non-government sources and databases, reviewed updates on litigation matters, checked for prohibited political contributions in Massachusetts, and verified the information in the submissions uh, were part of the packet. Uh, for the qualifiers from Penn National and for Mr. Snyder, who is the inside executive member of GLPI, the CFO, we also performed a review, which includes a, a review of detailed personal financial documents and a net worth analysis. And we also interviewed the three new individual qualifiers, Mr. George, Mr. Roger, Ms. Chamberlain. With respect to the five qualifiers who are outside directors of GLPI, our background review deviated from that of the inside Penn National qualifiers in the sense that we did not seek detailed personal financial records and did not perform a net worth analysis. You had, uh, the commission had previously uh, approved this protocol, but in all other respects, the investigations aligned. Uh, investigators also reviewed investi uh, uh, investigative information from other jurisdictions where Penn National has operations. Minutes of Penn's uh, compliance committee and audit committee meetings were reviewed, and of course, we reviewed PPC's uh, five-year history of compliance uh, in its operations in Massachusetts. Uh, Monica reviewed the uh, PPC and its parent company for financial uh, stability. Uh, she coordinated with Commissioner Zuniga on this aspect of the investigation. Uh, her review included standalone results of PPC as well as consolidated operating results of Penn National and its subsidiaries, with PPC being a subsidiary of Penn National. And she uh, had multiple discussions with um, uh, Justin Sebastiano, Todd George, Chris Rogers, and Dana Fortney, uh, the VP of Finance at PPC. And she will summarize her, uh, her findings uh, this morning. Uh, so with respect to the individuals that we performed an updated review on, I, I think I should just read, even though they're in, named in the letter, I'll just read the names. I think it's important for purposes of the record. Uh, that would be Jay Snowden, David Handler, James Cassetti, Ronald Naples, John Jackman, Barbara Shattuck Cohn, Stephen Snyder, Saul Reevstein, E. Scott Erdang, Joseph Marshall, Earl Shank. James Perry and Carol Linton. No derogatory uh, issues surfaced uh, whatsoever, no criminal matters, no automatic disqualifiers, no civil litigation that negatively impacts suitability, no derogatory media, 
no issues with licensure in other uh, jurisdictions. One note regarding Mr. Snyder, um, the CFO at GLPI, he is stepping down uh, from his role at GLPI after a long career at Penn and then serving as interim CFO at GLPI and then, uh, then the permanent. Uh, he's stepping down at the end of August. I do ask that you vote on his uh, suitability today because he does have some uh, significant responsibilities over the course of the next month. Um, Turning to the three executives that we did a full review on because they are new to us in Massachusetts, my thought uh, was that it would be worthwhile for you to hear a summary, summary of their background uh, and experience from Trooper, uh, Trooper Roger, who uh, conducted that review and had a chance to um, uh, meet and communicate with them uh, virtually uh, over the past month. So, uh, if, it, if it's okay with you, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to John at this point. Good morning, Trooper. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. So just to start here, I was tasked with the investigation for the Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment LLC Category 2 license renewal. Three individuals required a full background investigation, as Loretta mentioned. They were Todd George, Aaron Chamberlain, and Christopher Rogers. Um, with that full background investigation, a criminal records check, gaming license verification, education verification, political contribution check, litigation review, and a check of open source and law enforcement databases were performed. So just starting with uh, the first here, Todd George, I'll just give a brief background on him. So Mr. George began his career with Penn National Gaming in 2012 as general manager of Hollywood Casino in Indiana before transferring to Hollywood Casino in Missouri. Mr. George was soon promoted thereafter as senior vice president of regional operations for Penn National at the corporate level. Today, Mr. George currently serves as executive vice president of operations for Penn National Gaming. Now, prior to his time with Penn, Mr. George worked for Pinnacle Entertainment at various casino properties and with the Oneida Tribal Nation, both on the regulatory and casino side. Mr. George works out of Penn National's corporate office in Wyoming, Pennsylvania, and his responsibilities include overseeing corporate marketing, information technology, food and beverage, and all gaming related activities at all of Penn's properties. Mr. George's gaming licenses are, are in good standing in the jurisdictions where Penn conducts business. Also, as part of the background investigation, an interview was held with Mr. George where he detailed his work history and experiences. Mr. George was very candid and forthcoming with all information. Second, we have Erin Chamberlain. Ms. Chamberlain began her career with Penn National Gaming in September 2019 and currently serves as Senior Vice President of Regional Operations. Prior to her time with Penn, Ms. Chamberlain spent the majority of her career with Caesars Entertainment as general manager at various casino properties, including Horseshoe Casino in Indiana, Horseshoe Casino in Maryland, Caesars Atlantic City, and Planet Hollywood in Las Vegas. Ms. Chamberlain works out of Penn National's corporate office in Wyoming, Pennsylvania, and her responsibilities uh, to act as a liaison between Penn corporate office and Penn's Northeast casino properties. Ms. Chamberlain's gaming licenses were also checked uh, in the various jur jurisdictions where Penn conducts business, and they were all in good standing. It's part of the background investigation again, an interview was held with Ms. Chamberlain, where she was responsive, open, and honest. And finally, we have Christopher Rogers. Mr. Rogers began his career with Penn National Gaming in 2013 as Vice President and Deputy Corporate Counsel. After several years, Mr. Rogers was promoted to Senior Vice President of Corporate Development. Today, Mr. Rogers currently serves as Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Penn National Gaming. Now, prior to his time with Penn, Mr. Rogers served in various legal counsel positions at Vincent and Elkins and Ropes and Gray. Mr. Rogers works out of Penn National's corporate office in Wyoming, Pennsylvania, and his responsibilities include identifying merger and acquisition opportunities, monitoring lease agreements, overseeing property development, and identifying new strategic business partners. Mr. Rogers' gaming licenses are in good standing in all the jurisdictions with Penn Canucks business. 
as part of the background investigation and interview was held with Mr. Rogers, where we discussed his personal history. Again, he was open and honest. All in all, with a full review of these three qualifiers, they were all very cooperative and forthcoming. Tina Habel, the licensing manager for Penn National Gaming, and Melissa Ferrillo, the director in licensing and legal affairs for gaming and leisure properties, were accommodating and very helpful by providing information quickly upon request. So at this time, if any of the commissioners have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Commissioners, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, no, very clean report. Um, you know, <laughs> reviewing them as I did, I, there is there are no issues. So I um, I appreciate the the investigative team and the cooperation of uh, those uh, being licensed to uh, to make this process uh, simple. And um, just thanks to everybody. Other other questions, um, perhaps. No, not a question so much as just, I think, a point that should be clear on the record, which is that um, in addition to the people that have been discussed, there is another qualifier, David Williams, who's the CFO at Penn National, and that that qualifying report, um, that suitability report is still pending in the normal course. There's nothing abnormal about it, but I do think that it just bears putting on the record today that in addition to the people we're discussing, we'll, we'll be back um, in short order probably on Mr. Williams, unless I'm incorrect on no, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, there's also um, Mr. Soriano as well, uh, who he was designated recently and um, his is in uh, progress. He's on the call today. Uh, so those two are uh, underway now and uh, we'll be hearing about them. Uh, in the Commissioner Zunica or Commissioner Stebbins? No questions from you, Madam Chair. Good report. Commissioner Zinnick? Uh, yes, same, same here. Thank you to the team. Uh, always uh, very um, comprehensive and thoughtful. And thank you for uh, everybody at Penn for uh, all, their, um, all their work. Yeah, I would just add the comment that first up, uh, uh, Loretta, thank you for the thorough memo that is included in the packet. It really highlights the extensive nature of our qualification process and the importance of it as we um, work to make sure that the integrity of the gaming uh, is, is always a priority and the um, cooperation and the candidness of, of the uh, qualifiers is you know, very much uh, core to the uh, preservation of, of uh, a casino industry business that Massachusetts expects here. So we know it's extensive. We also know it mirrors what happens across the country. We also know you folks are really used to it. What I also appreciate is that the work that, that went into um, <clears throat> really thinking about the relicensing process is, is, is actually showing to have been uh, very helpful because we were able to take measures and steps to reduce the, um, the workload for not only our internal team, but for the qualifiers by um, rec being practical and recognizing the the, uh, the work that has been done relatively recently, so it's 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 showed that it was a good thoughtful process. Loretta, and Chair, so. speaking of extensive, I do have some additional comments, as as does um, Monica and Andrew. So I I, I wanted to um, make sure you know we have more to say. Oh yes, I know that. That was just for the, the suitability size. I know that there's more, much more to come. But I'm just saying in terms of suitability, yes. the process of, of um, reviewing the suitability uh, of these individuals, it, it's very much core to the preservation of the integrity of this business. And uh, we just want to acknowledge that right now. Right, it's all about the people for, for sure. It's all, exactly. Thank you, Loretta. Uh, and, and Karen, I'm, I'm sure you're agreeing with that as we, we uh, acknowledge the numbers of, of folks who are being examined as part of this relicensure process. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Okay, now uh, we wouldn't, one, I'm very interested in hearing from Monica, but two, it's also just very much nice to see her in person today. Um, What's next? Is, is she next? She, she is, I did want to mention before we go into her review, the, the letter in your packet does reflect uh, that uh, 
background of the licensee itself and Penn National apart from the financial review was conducted, you know, those general integrity pieces, uh, the document review, the and the review of a license standing in other jurisdictions, and no systemic issues uh, with operations were identified at any of the uh, pen operated facilities. Uh, so with that background, I think it's perfect timing if uh, Monica could jump in and um, summarize uh, her uh, findings on the financial aspect. Thank Great. you, Monica. Hi, uh, thanks Loretta, and good morning everyone. Um, so the financial review of our casino licensee and its ultimate parent company was split into two main parts. Uh, first, the review of PPC and Penn National financial results in the last five years from 15 to 2019. And then second, uh, the review of the negative impact that the COVID-19 pandemic have on the consolidated group and the mitigating measures that were put in place by Penn. The financial operating results uh, of PPC and Penn National in the last five years were largely positive. Uh, PPC produced positive gross income in all five years, with increasing revenues each year until 2019, which is the same year that Encore Boston Harbor opened. Um, net losses were incurred for two of those years, uh, driven largely by the impairment costs and um, the income tax expenses. For Penn National, the group produced net income each year, um, and after the $2.9 billion Pinnacle acquisition in 2018, with it the incorporation of 14 additional gaming properties, total revenue increased by more than 45%. Uh, Penn's new debt requirements were met um, in 2019, and the group was in compliance with each covenant as per the credit agreement. It was something with the plumbing. What, one okay. minute, please. I think that there's a phone number five that ends with 7758. We, we can hear your conversation, so you may want to thank you. Go ahead, Monica. Okay. Um, so soon after the close of the 2019 calendar year, the gaming industry was negatively impacted by the spread of the coronavirus, which ultimately led to casino closures across the globe. Uh, Penn National was no exception. All 41 of its properties were shuttered soon after March 18, 2020. Um, at that point, maintaining adequate liquidity was a core focus for Penn National. Uh, various mitigating and cost-cutting measures were then put in place. One such measure was realized on April 16, when Penn and its principal landlord, GLPI, completed its agreement for the sale of the real estate assets of um, Tropicana Las Vegas. In turn, GLPI granted $337.5 million in rent credits and also allow Penn to the exclusive right to acquire operation of one of uh, GLPI's properties. Then to increase its liquidity position, Penn secured additional sources of funds through the equity um, capital market. Um, on May 14, it completed its previously announced public offering of its common stock and convertible senior notes. In aggregate, this added approximately $675 million to the group's liquidity balance. Um, overall, the IB's review of, of PPC and Penn National's uh, operating, financial operating results uh, from 2015 to 19 did not uncover any derogatory information. Since uh, the start of the pandemic, Penn National has put in place multiple operations to reduce cost. Uh, maintain lease and debt requirements, preserve and even increase its liquidity levels. As such, there's no indication that the consolidated group is unable to meet its obligations. Um, as of the date of, of this report, of my report, uh, multiple Penn National properties have reopened, uh, which translates to inflow of cash and, and earnings after months of, of closures. Um, so, so that concludes my summary. Um, I can pause now for any questions the commissioners have. Commissioner Zuniga, I'll turn to you first. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Monica. I'll just um, uh, ma make a quick uh, comment and then maybe ask a question of uh, Mr. Snowden. Um, I, was, I had an opportunity to um, to join Monica in some of these discussions, the ones that she's summarizing now, 
and uh, relative to, of course, the most uh, serious risk in this process has been the COVID-19 um, uh, circumstances, but in the mitigating measures uh, that have been, in my view, very successful by PEN and, and, and GLPI in terms of addressing uh, those challenges. So, um, which I think is, is, is as good as anybody, uh, uh, it, and, and will continue to be a, 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 a cause of um, something that we need to monitor. So, I, I'd ask uh, Jay um, if you can just comment uh, uh, to the extent you can as how you see the next uh, few months in terms of uh, and uh, continue to um, to weather what are uh, challenging times uh, with. Um, uh, with with uh, with the COVID nineteen situation. Sure. Uh, good morning, Commissioner Zuniga, and uh, great question. Um, look, I, I guess the the way I would characterize and, and begin my response is to say, you know, we uh, we were not prepared for this. I don't I don't know that anyone was, even in our scenario planning around, you know, really stress testing the balance sheet and um, the company's response to. Maybe a you know a 2008 2009 like recession. Uh, we had never anticipated um, being forced to close down all 41 of our properties and and for a period of months where we would be generating zero revenue. And I'm really proud of how our our company um, from top to bottom has responded. Um, no no complaints. It's been you know what can we do as a team to get through this. And, um, you know, and I think it was just, I think, recapped well by, by Monica, a, a number of measures that we've taken, um, working with our landlord, working with our bank lending group, um, and then tapping the, the capital markets as well to uh, fortify the balance sheet during very challenging times. And looking out um, has been difficult. You know, <laughs> typically I can answer that question, you know, comfortably. And, um, talking about the future today is difficult, it's challenging. I'll tell you, uh, based on what we are, how we're feeling today, you know, we, we now have reopened all but three of our 41 properties. And um, some of them we reopened as, 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 um, uh, as long ago as May. So we've had properties in Louisiana and Mississippi that have now been open for two and a half months. And I would characterize the reopenings is having gone much like uh, Loretta, Loretta mentioned here in Massachusetts, they've gone well. Um, you know, we've been very focused working with regulators in all, all the states we operate, uh, health officials, uh, our team members from a training standpoint and preparation. And um, we haven't seen visitation fully recover yet as expected. Um, but we have, we've been very pleased with the uh, solicited and unsolicited response um, and remarks that we've gotten from our customers and our team members in terms of uh, safety measures and how seriously we have taken this. So that's been our number one focus. Of course, having the properties reopen and generating revenue again was very important for the company, but we also understand and take very seriously that if we don't um, really adhere to the requirements state by state uh, and create a safe and comfortable environment for our team members and our guests, then we could find ourselves where we were a few months ago and, and, and no one wants that. So that's really been our focus. You know, every, every operational update call that I have with the team, it always starts and ends with how's it going from a safety standpoint and let's continue to step up our efforts and make sure that we are uh, leaders in this area at all of our properties across the nation. So I'm cautiously optimistic, I guess is the way that I would characterize how I feel today. It's, it's hard to be any more confident than that because we just don't, none of us sitting here today know exactly uh, what the future has for us. And um, we're just staying very close to uh, all of you in Massachusetts because we're going through this for the first time. I'm pleased with the level of partnership um, that uh, Madam Chair mentioned this morning uh, during the opening remarks. And uh, we're feeling that on our end. I hope you're feeling that on your end as we continue to navigate together. Um, but we'll continue to stay very close with you and, and happy to update you on what we're seeing and hearing um, and experiencing across our portfolio of properties in the 19 states where we operate. Uh, today, I'm feeling about, about as good as I think I can. I, um, I the, the, it's, it's difficult to feel great even though you've reopened the properties because 
we have had, um, you know, during the peak, over 95% of the company's team members were furloughed, and that's not a great feeling. Um, so we've been obviously bringing back our workforce, but we, we haven't and, and likely aren't going to get back to where we were um, because times have changed and, and, and we're evolving and we're at limited capacity in our properties and the amenity offering is different today and we're not sure yet uh, when that's going to be appropriately relaxed. And so that, that part's very challenging. Uh, we, we talk about that every day and um, we've continued to keep our furloughed team members. We, we cover their uh, medical benefits. We just announced uh, earlier this week that we're extending that now through the end of August. We had initially uh, announced end of June and then we extended that through July and then again earlier this week through the end of August. And um, you know, making those phone calls to bring team members back is uh, it's great. And um, we hope to continue to make more of those calls as, uh, as time goes across the country at all of our properties. Well, th thank you. Thank you for that, um, Jay. I, um, I remember when we uh, did the initial analysis and, um, and ultimately the award of, uh, of the license to you guys, guys five, five years ago, from a, from a financial standpoint, your geographic diversification and uh, your, uh, your expertise in dealing with multiple, multiple regulations, regulators and states um, was uh, uh, clearly an asset, and uh, I, I agree that nobody could have predicted this pandemic. Uh, it is proving uh, that uh, that was indeed an asset, and you're you're managing as best as anybody can. So um, thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner. Other other questions for um, Monica, and or comments. On I would just add that um, Monica's report does highlight how uh, nimble the entity was at, uh, as you met that crisis and, and worked hard to uh, ensure the stability of the company. And again, uh, this, this review that I commented is on, Monica focused on the entity, again, an important part of our review as we look at relationship. Um, Madam Chair, I would have just another question of the team. Um, again, we this was part of um, clearly what uh, what Monica uh, uh, looked at along with Loretta. But um, anything you can talk about, uh, Jay or or uh, Lance, um, about how PPC um, uh, fits uh, and stands within your own uh, company, and, and and anything else that you could add. Um, at the property level uh, that you might want to mention as we go forward? Sure, uh, and, I, and I have some prepared remarks, so I apologize if this will be a little bit redundant. Um, but, you know, we, we as a company uh, commissioner have really focused on in, in two areas because our goal as a company is to be the omni-channel leader of uh, gaming and sports offerings across the country. And of course, our footprint across the country is really, really important as PASPA was overturned in May of 2018 and sports bet betting became a state's rights issue. Um, and now we've seen over 20 states already legalize sports betting. And so we've been very focused on continuing to grow our uh, brick and mortar properties, businesses, our database, of course, at each one of these markets is really, really important for us. And though sports betting uh, has not yet been legalized in Massachusetts, it was mentioned by Todd that it's being considered. And um, so we're very focused both on the, the sports betting opportunities as well as the gaming opportunities. And Plain Ridge is a really important uh, property for us. It's our only property in the state of Massachusetts. It has a great database uh, of customers in the Boston MSA, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and um, there's only three licenses in the state of Massachusetts, obviously, as all of you know. And so it's a coveted license for us. And it's a big part of our overall strategy. Um, as we continue to, to build our database, we now have uh, over 5 million active database users. And many of them are from the Plain Ridge Park property. Uh, really important for us as we think about um, the hub and spoke. We have a couple of properties in Las Vegas. And so for us to be able to offer 
our customers in Massachusetts, uh, visits to Las Vegas and, and within our loyalty program is very powerful. And um, that's something that you look across the country and, and we're in so many key um, MSAs uh, in the Midwest, the Northeast, down South and, and out West. And, and Boston is a really critical market for us. Um, and, and, and horse racing, of course, is uh, something that we're the largest uh, paramutual operator in the country. And uh, we've been very proud of uh, what we've been able to do in just growing the business. Um, it was a struggling uh, 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 st standard bred property for a long time. And now, uh, you know, you look at the results and we're seeing growth in purses uh, of over 100%. It's been, it's been a great story, really remarkable. And um, it's been a great partnership uh, working with all of you on the regulatory side, as well as the horsemen. And it's a, it's in a, it's a very important property in our overall portfolio. Additional questions for, um, I do want to allow uh, uh, PPC and Penn National to, to uh, make whatever presentations they have planned. And I know already you'll introduce them. But any further questions with respect to Monica's uh, report and Jay's comments? All really helpful. Monica, thank you so much. Uh, Loretta? Uh, sure. So the uh, next piece is the compliance piece for our licensee, for, uh, for PPC. And really, Andrew Steffen is in the best position uh, with the boots on the ground to uh, to describe uh, that uh, not only uh, operationally, but also with a bird's eye view on the uh, relationships uh, with uh, the licensed uh, directors, supervisors, and casino staff. From my role as Chief Enforcement Counsel, I did want to mention uh, a couple of things that issued uh, from the uh, Chief Enforcement Council, which were uh, uh, two civil administrative penalties over the course of the five-year term of the license. There was one in 2016 uh, for $10,000 for non-compliance with beverage storage and distribution uh, requirements, and one in 2017 for $65,000 for non-compliance with minimum staffing in the security department. Uh, those final promptly uh, remitted in both instances. Andrew can detail the types of uh, responses with training and I see uh, submissions that uh, were um, implemented uh, on the licensee's part. Uh, there were also in my role a number of notices of non-compliance uh, that issued in the course of the five-year term in the areas again of minimum staffing and security uh, which is a uh, the issuance of the notice is a prerequisite uh, for the fine, so it should be no uh, surprise that you would have seen that uh, twice uh, now. Uh, entry by underage, uh, the beverage storage, again, no surprise, you'd see that twice. Uh, there were two slot payout matters, a man trap uh, notice, uh, self-exclusion uh, notice of noncompliance, uh, a, a game setting uh, notice, and as part of those notices, uh, there were requirements uh, implemented that uh, the licensee take m material steps to uh, correct. Andrew, again, uh, will, um, uh, will address those issues. So I think if I can ask Andrew to jump in, that would be perfect. Good morning, Andrew. Just Good again. Morning, Commissioners, thank you, Loretta. Again, I just want to thank you, Andrew, uh, before you get started uh, with all the work that you did uh, to support the safe reopening. Uh, I know that you've done it with your team, but I want to just give full credit to you for your leadership in that um, your partnership at PPC. Thank you. It was an entire team effort, too. We have a, we have a great team down here. Um, I have a few prepared comments, briefly touching on PPC's compliance history, after which I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. Uh, so to begin, since opening the property in 2015, the IB have been on site at PPC 24-7, overseeing several aspects of the property, including but not limited to certifying revenue, auditing slot machines, observer security, staffing, 
reviewing alcohol service and storage and monitoring the premises for underage individuals. All of our observations, whether compliant or non-compliant, are then reported in our iTrack documented system. Um, all non-compliant incidents are vetted and reviewed by me as the senior supervisor of the property. Minor instances of non-compliance are brought to the attention of the appropriate department head, whether it be uh, security, surveillance, slots, et cetera. While the more serious issues are discussed directly with PPC's compliance manager, Lisa McKenney, uh, these discussions take place through scheduled bi-weekly compliance meetings or sometimes just through regular catch-ups. Uh, the more serious offenses may also warrant a non-compliance form that Loretta mentioned uh, or an NCF. These NCFs, which the IEB began issuing at the start of 2018, are a way of officially and formally documenting our non-compliant observations with the licensee. Um, at PPC, these NCFs are sent directly to Lisa McKenney for review with the request of a signature acknowledging the non-compliant issues. Uh, through our discussions, PPC has responded professionally, promptly, and appropriately through internal control submission updates, increased staff training, as well as progressive discipline measures with their employees as needed. Uh, through their immediate response, all issues are rectified in a timely and efficient manner. Um, additionally, serious and or repeated items of noncompliance may be elevated and sent to IEB Assistant Director Bruce Band for further review with Loretta Lilios. Um, again, as Loretta mentioned in the summary of suitability, uh, the section on compliance history briefly describes the two civil administrative penalties as a result of these repeated infractions. Uh, with regards to alcohol service, the IB have observed zero compliance issues with alcohol service since the actions taken by PPC in 2016. Uh, likewise, with regards to security, since 2017, uh, PPC has remained in compliance with no major security issues. Their current, their current security director, Greg DeMarco, has kept compliance with all aspects of security staffing and overall compliance with the security plan. Uh, also in your letter is the reference to individuals that have been identified as underage on PPC's gaming floor. Uh, in the five years of operation, there have been a total of 43 instances where an underage has gained access to the gaming floor. From that, however, only nine cases was an underage observed gaming at a slot machine, which if you break it down, comes out to about one or two underage uh, gaming per year. Uh, each separate underage incident is then discussed with compliance and security together. Uh, PPC has done a formidable job assuring compliance with underages on the property. They have also placed additional signage throughout the premises to deter underage individuals from entering the gaming floor. Uh, furthermore, with regards to slot machines and the slot department, one item I'll speak on briefly is the jackpot switches, which the IEB observed early last year, 2019. A jackpot switch, as you may remember, transpires when a patron who activated a slot jackpot win would literally hand it off to a nearby patron or friend to claim the jackpot. Uh, this could occur for several reasons, such as a patron attempting to avoid taxes or if they might be excluded from the property. Uh, after discussions with compliance, surveillance, and the slot department, it was agreed that PPC would review all taxable jackpots to ensure the correct patron was paid. After the IEB presentation to the commission late last year, and as a result of this new policy, zero jackpot switches have been confirmed at PPC. Uh, lastly, the IEB have observed no major issues of compliance with regards to PPC's floor plan, their surveillance department, or credit issuance and suspension procedures. And quickly, just to close here, uh, PPC being the first casino to open in the state of Massachusetts, there may have been some regulatory bumps in the road. However, over the last 18 to 24 months, it has been nothing short of a smooth process with limited non-compliant incidents. Uh, we as the IEB have a very strong and professional working relationship with PPC and their entire team as a whole. Thank you. Uh, that concludes my prepared comments. I'd be happy to answer any questions from the commissioners or we can hand it back over to Loretta. Questions? Um, if, I, if I may, Madam Chair, um, again, not really a question, but I, I just think this compliance record is exemplary. And I think Penn National, um, as we lived through, um, you know, there was some skepticism about gaming coming to Massachusetts. And I think this, from the beginning, um, Penn National took this responsibility seriously, being the first casino, and the compliance record, in particular with underage. That was a particular concern to residents here. I'm always impressed every time we have a quarterly report that um, that Penn National does such a good job at um, 
keeping those individuals off the gaming floor um, and you know whether it be underage drinking or gambling um, those numbers are are really really strong so I just again uh, commend uh, both teams our team for being diligent in their responsibilities but working collaboratively to really make this an, an effort to um, uh, to really uh, make sure that compliance is done in a way that is um, is fair and everyone knows what the ground rules are and it's so clear to me that Penn National takes their responsibility here very seriously so I just you know when I look at those numbers every quarterly report I'm always impressed so thank you and um, thanks to our team as well Madam, Madam Chair, just to, to jump in and talk about Andrew's comments about switching, which is uh, we, the commission, had a meeting on that not too long ago. But uh, just to express my thanks to uh, not only Andrew and his team, but the folks at PPC. This is somewhat of a, a switch in terms of responsibility, and it involves you know PPC's surveillance department and, and other resources at PPC to make sure that people aren't switching. As Andrew pointed out, we don't want a VSC in the building who really shouldn't be there for their own good. We certainly don't want anybody who's trying to uh, get around any other obligations that they might have to the Commonwealth to avoid that. So I uh, appreciate Andrew's team working on this, and I know we're focusing on it at the other properties, but also to thank uh, PPC and their security and surveillance staff for taking those extra steps to make sure that uh, switching is uh, being avoided or at least being caught when they uh, when a slot machine pays out. Other comments or questions? To, um, just, just, okay. I just wanted to reiterate um, what Commissioner Cameron said about particularly the, um, the compliance with minors on the floor and the drinking on the floor. Uh, it's a number I've repeatedly asked licensees about and, and as she said it's impressive what the what the low numbers are. I'm curious, Andrew and Loretta, I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't have an answer, um, but when you're saying underage drinking I'm or underage on the floor, um, I'm assuming it could mean less than 18 or is it exclusively 18 to 21? And if there is a difference there, do you know what the breakdown is in terms of how many of those, um, you know, 40 something episodes were people, somebody under the age of 18, if any? So the, the 43 instances um, include all individuals under the age of 21. So that might include um, toddlers on the floor as well. Uh, they're brought on by a parent. Um, I don't have a breakdown of the 18 to 21, but uh, we can get that up too. Do you have a sense if it's mostly 18 to 21 as opposed to under 18? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Again, I can have to look at those numbers. Um, Okay, uh, and I suspect it's Commissioner O'Brien's point is that if it's more between 18 and 21, it's because perhaps folks weren't ID'd somehow because they look older. But if, if we have folks who are much more youthful, that would be a bigger concern. Well, in the proximity to Rhode Island, where it's 18, That's, so I'm just trying to see, you know, the number may be even more impressive than just 43 out of the last so many years. Right, and, and if I can jump in, my recollection, although I don't have the data in front of me, but when we issued the notice, my recollection was when we went through, you know, incident by incident, it was that um, 18 to 21. older person, you know, right under 21, the 18 to 21 range. That's what I think too, yeah. Um, we can we can follow up with that, Commissioner O'Brien. That's an excellent point, and, and I think that what folks have heard today is that minors on the gaming floor have is something that we very carefully monitor. All three licensees are very aware of that and uh, are committed to um, ensuring that that doesn't happen and, and give very precise records on a quarterly ba basis. So we thank you for the compliance on that front. And as uh, Commissioner Cameron overall, it's just a very, very positive report. <clears throat> and. Uh, what you've also heard is that we do monitor the compliance very closely. So the fact that it is exemplary is, is really a feather in your cap because we are watching, we are monitoring, we do it fairly, we have a great team that does it fairly, and we have the full cooperation of all of PPC. So thank you. Commissioner Zunica, we haven't heard from you. 
Are you all set? Yes. yes, thank you. All set. Just to um, to reiterate the points made uh, first by Commissioner Cameron, uh, I think their compliance record is exemplary. It's important to put into context the the low numbers uh, with the the thousands and thousands of people that go through the casino on a daily basis, uh, and um, and I think again it all. Uh, uh, it's uh, centered around the, the cooperation of both uh, the team and the property, the IEB, as well as the people at Penn. So, thank you. Excellent. Loretta. Uh, so, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, our statute and regulations do call for the IEB to make a recommendation on suitability, so I'm prepared to do that. I do also want to acknowledge that uh, Mr. Snowden and, and Lance George uh, have uh, some comments uh, that they would like to address the commission about. I can make the, uh, the recommendation before uh, or after. Um, I, I'm sure that some of the comments from Mr. Snowden and Mr. George will be re reflective on the past five years, but also uh, forward looking. Uh, I do want to remind that the meeting today, the vote today, the, um, the notice today is a suitability determination. I'm sure that there will be uh, more formal presentations as part of the overall renewal uh, to, uh, to look at uh, some of the future planning uh, pieces. Uh, but Madam Chair, I, I'd ask you now, would you like to hear the IEB's recommendation now or uh, move forward uh, with, um, with the comments uh, uh, from Ken and, and PPC? I think we should do the business and then allow for some forward thinking uh, from uh, Mr. Snowden. Um, so do we have, I, I know that you're making a recommendation, then we'll have a, a motion made, I, I think on each individual. Great. Thank uh, you. So taking into consideration the entirety of the investigation and PPC's compliance history over the initial five year term of the category two license, the IEB recommends that the commission issue positive determinations of suitability to PPC and the qualifiers that comprise this application and find PPC suitable under the criteria listed in the gaming law and regulations. Do I have a motion that would reflect that recommendation? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission issue a positive determination of suitability to the Category 2 licensee, Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment LLC, doing business as Plain Ridge Park Casino, aka PPC, as well as the following qualifiers. Jay Snowden, Chief Executive Officer and Director, David Handler, Chairman of the Board, Todd George, Executive VP of Operations, Chris Rogers, Senior VP and Chief Strategy Officer, Aaron Chamberlain, VP of Regional Operations, James Scacchetti, Director, Ron Naples, Director, John Jackman, Director, Barbara Shattuck, Cone, Director, Stephen Snyder, Senior VP, Chief Financial Officer for GLPI, Saul Reibstein, Director, GLPI, E. Scott Erdang, Outside Director, GLPI, Joseph Marshall III, Outside Director, GLPI, Earl Shanks, Outside Director, GLPI, James Perry, Outside Director, GLPI, uh, and Carol Linton, Outside Director, GLPI, as well as uh, the Entity Qualifier for Category 2 License and National Gaming Inc., uh, aka PNGI. Second. Second. I want to make sure that all of you are coming without hearing from um, Mr. Snowden and Mr. George at this time, because if it in any way would help you on this vote, we certainly can have them interject now. We're all good? Thank you. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Mr. Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes, five zero. Thank you. Loretta? Uh, so at this time, uh, uh, I understand that Mr. Snowden would like to uh, 
continue to make some remarks, so I would turn it over uh, to Mr. Snowden, uh, President, CEO, and Director of Penn National Gaming Inc. Thanks, Thank Loretta. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. It's, uh, it, it's a real honor to be with you today. Uh, it's historic. It's the first five-year license renewal hearing in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And um, it really is, uh, it's hard to believe. I remember cutting the ribbon with many of you like it was yesterday. And uh, given what we're all going through this year, in some ways that feels like a lifetime ago, uh, all in one. So, um, but it's great to be here with you. You know, we, we, um, we've been working together with you and the staff uh, in Massachusetts for, you know, the better part of uh, seven years because of the, the the license bidding process that was so thorough in Massachusetts and I feel like we really have been able to get to know you well and you've gotten a chance to get to know us really well and uh, we're very proud uh, to have been the first casino to open its doors in Massachusetts and we recognize that that came with a lot of responsibility to establish a solid footing for the gaming industry in the Commonwealth. Um, we pledged at the time um, to, to many of you who were there that we would endeavor to make you proud of us. I remember personally having this conversation with Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner Stebbins, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, and, uh, and others on the, in the commission and, and staff at that time. And um, that we wanted to make you proud um, from a reputational and an operational standpoint. And um, there's, there's been growing pains. I think many of those were covered. There's, there's no five-year track record that's perfect and it, it, ne it will never be, um, but we endeavor to work with you very closely. And um, I really hope and, uh, that, that, that you agree that we've lived up to our commitment to helping to ensure the integrity of the gaming and racing industries in Massachusetts. And from our perspective, the first five years at, at Plain Ridge Park have been an unqualified success for our company. Uh, for the town of Plainville and the surrounding communities. There were many concerns you'll recall and um, many great concerns and uh, of course, uh, well-founded and, um, but I feel like we've, we've really proven um, to those surrounding communities that had the concerns as well as the Commonwealth as a whole that we would be a great operator and um, that gaming would be a great industry for the state of Massachusetts. Uh, since our opening, we've contributed over 13 and a half million dollars in post community and impact fee payments and nearly 372 million in gaming taxes to the Commonwealth and fees to the horsemen. As the nation's largest paramutual racing operator, as I mentioned earlier, we have a deep history in horse racing and we're honored to be able to operate Massachusetts only live horse racing venue. And when we first met with the commission to explain why Penn National Gaming was the best possible partner for the Commonwealth, we talked quite a bit about our plans to help preserve standard bread racing here and the family farms the industry supports. Uh, today, racing at Plain Ridge Park is thriving, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the horse breeding program in Massachusetts is up 110% and average daily purses, as I mentioned earlier, have increased almost 100%, uh, 96 to be exact. And Lance tells me uh, in conversation that this past Sunday was not only uh, a track record set, at Plain Ridge Park, but a world record for trotters was established in the spirit of mass trot, which was great. We look forward to continuing to build upon the track success, of course, in the years ahead. Uh, while the last several months have presented uh, unprecedented challenges we talked about earlier for our company in dealing with the ongoing pandemic and the subsequent closures of our entire portfolio of properties, uh, today I'm extremely proud as I sit here and uh, of the way that our corporate and our property teams have come together uh, along with our valued team members and have really ri risen to the occasion, uh, working tirelessly uh, every day, uh, especially over, you know, since mid-March when, when, when all of this really began. And uh, working alongside all of you um, on the regulatory side and our state health officials, uh, we've managed to reopen all but three of our casino properties, as I mentioned earlier. And we can't thank you enough for all of your efforts to help us resume operations at Plain Ridge in a way that puts the health and safety of our team members and guests first. The comprehensive health and sanitation protocols that we've implemented have been holding up well so far, and we're continuing to strictly adhere and will continue to strictly adhere to our testing and contact tracing procedures in partnership with you. On the financial front, we've managed as a company to significantly improve our financial position as a result of our continued COVID mitigation efforts, 
as well as our successful capital raise um, that was covered earlier of $675 million in early May and the strong results uh, so far at our reopened properties. All of this has rendered us a strong balance sheet and we're well positioned for continued growth through our unique omni-channel strategy, which I started to mention earlier, uh, which is powered also because of the sports betting opportunity. Uh, we plan to launch our uh, sports betting app, uh, which we're very excited about uh, sometime later in the third quarter. We're, we're looking at a, a early September launch in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and then subsequent to that launch, we will be um, making that, that product available in a number of other states, uh, Indiana, Iowa, uh, Michigan, New Jersey, Colorado, uh, and others. And of course, we, we look forward to being able to do that in Massachusetts, hopefully soon. Uh, we'll see how the legislative process plays out in the, in the coming weeks and months. So we're really excited about that. Um, uh, Plain Ridge Park is a, is a really important uh, part of that strategy, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, we, we need to continue to grow our database. And this is a, a key growth market for us because uh, it's still so relatively new. You know, some of our markets we've been operating in now for decades and the opportunity to grow the database is more challenging because um, most people have visited a casino and it's still so new in Massachusetts. Five years is not a long time and we've seen tremendous database growth throughout those five years and we think there's still a tremendous amount of potential to continue to grow uh, our database particularly as new products like sports betting become legalized which hopefully happens uh, relatively soon um, we've always said and i know you you know us well we've always said that our team members are the lifeblood of our company and um, while some of our team members would remain furloughed given the ongoing occupancy restrictions and limited amenity offerings at the properties currently um, and I mentioned this earlier, I'm just pleased that we were able to extend our medical and pharmacy benefits to all of our impacted team members through the end of August. Uh, in addition, our COVID-19 emergency relief fund, which we established uh, back in March, uh, we were able to raise $1.7 million um, within the company. And we've already provided much needed financial assistance to approximately 1,000 of our team members across the country. and. Um, it, there's still dollars there uh, that are available to help those in need. And there's many of those. You can imagine the heart-wrenching uh, stories that we uh, review and wish that we could, you know, we wish that amount of money was uh, limitless, but we're continuing to spread that around and um, we're ready to help over a thousand people. It feels, feels good. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lance George, um, who you all know very well. He's going to talk in more detail about our successful track record over the last five years, as well as our ongoing COVID-19 mitigation efforts, specifically at Plain Ridge Park Casino. And then, um, of course, we'll open it up to questions. Happy to answer any questions anyone may have after, after Lance. So Lance, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jed. Uh, good morning, everyone. Certainly been my pleasure to work with members of the Gaming Commission for over the last six years, I guess, uh, representing both Plain Ridge and it's safe to say, as, as Jay mentioned, that we are proud of these last five years and, and certainly very much looking forward to, uh, to the next five. To that end, and the current plan, I believe, and as you are aware, in September, Plain Ridge will provide a more detailed presentation reflecting on some of the operational highlights during our first five-year term, and we'll offer a few thoughts on, uh, on the next five years. Jay touched on a couple of those topics already, the continuation of racing, the potential for sports betting, as well as operating in a, in a COVID environment and hopefully a post-COVID environment. And so as we wrap our comments, and as Loretta pointed out earlier, we do have several folks from Penn National on the call today. We are certainly more than happy to, uh, to answer any questions that you might have. And so with that, I believe I'll turn it back over to you, Madam Chair, and, uh, and invite any questions any of the commissioners have for us. Thank you, Jay and Lance. Commissioner Sunagan, are you leaning in? Oh, you're muted. There you go. Um, I, I, I was not leaning in. Uh, just, just to thank uh, everybody um, uh, for, for your presentations and look forward to the September presentation. I'm sorry, it was just that your, your tile was lit up, so. There you go, Commissioner, thank you. Other questions or comments for Jay or Lance? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd just like to, to offer a comment. And first of all, to, 
to thank uh, Mr. Snowden, Mr. George, for their present, you know, for their thoughts and their comments. Um, you know, just to think back a few years ago, we probably put you guys in the toughest position because we uh, we located you as close to the competition in neighboring states as we uh, possibly could have, um, in realizing that. Uh, because of the gaming bill, you didn't have necessarily all the tools and amenities uh, uh, that the competition had. But uh, I, to date, I would say the results are really impressive. Um, thank you for your commitment to Massachusetts, certainly your commitment to the town of Plainville. And uh, we look forward to uh, talking again with you at, uh, at the, the public hearing when it's scheduled. Other questions or comments? I echo the, um, that I am looking forward to the, the full report as we go forward in this process and your continued contributions. I think it's, um, it should be noted that's not lost on anyone how you have impacted Plain Ridge. Just uh, a visit to the, uh, their public safety building uh, indicates how, how much, um, how, what a great neighbor you have been and how much uh, benefit the impact of your enterprise has been uh, for that community and the surrounding communities. And of course, uh, <clears throat> the hundreds of millions of dollars that you have provided to the Commonwealth uh, is, is noted here and continues to be noted. But you've also done it, as we've heard so far today, um, <clears throat> for cooperation and compliance with the expectations of this regulatory body. So we thank you and look forward to the continuing process. I think, it, uh, I'm not sure today if we'll hear, I think we're gonna, uh, that will come in the uh, next few commission meetings, a little bit of a timeline with respect to the next steps on the relicensing process, so stay tuned. And, uh, and until then, I know um, President Snowden, you are on vacation, so we appreciate the fact that you got up very early today, uh, took time from your family, to make this uh, this meeting particularly meaningful. So thank you very much. And uh, Lance, I don't think you are on vacation. Uh, I'm not. But we appreciate your, um, of He's course, in the entire- He's in the Pardon? office, every day in the office is vacation. <laughs> that, that's right, and, 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 and duly noted. And also the, the several members of uh, PPC and Penn National uh, team that uh, visited us with us today and been part of this meeting. So we thank you and, and uh, thank you for the continued cooperation and best wishes to you and to all of your team at PPC that they remain safe and sound. We uh, appreciate their work and their contribution. Thanks for the kind words, Madam Chair. And um, I did just wanna publicly say that, uh, you know, it's been, Terrific working with all of you. We'll continue to be terrific working with all of you. Um, not every state's the same from a regulatory relationship standpoint for a variety of reasons across 19 states, uh, different approaches, uh, different tenure. Um, it, it's great working with all of you, has been. And, um, um, you know, we're here if you have ideas or feedback on how we could do a better job from a compliance standpoint, um, how we can further the relationship and uh, continue to make you proud for having awarded us a license five years ago and allowed us to open and operate the property. And uh, my hat's off, of course, to Lance, who's been there uh, since day one. And, and it, it wasn't perfect. You know, uh, early on, uh, we were trying to figure out, you know, what were these revenue levels we're going to sustain and volumes. And so there's so many things you work through. And um, Lance has just been such a steady force there for his, for his team, our team. Uh, at Plain Ridge and, and I think has done a great job building a tremendous reputation and relationship with all of you. And um, he's one of our best. So uh, really appreciate Lance and the role he's played. And um, you know, he won't be there forever because we have plans for Lance that are gonna require him to uh, take on additional responsibility. And um, we'll talk to you about that at some point when appropriate, but um, you know, my hat's off to Lance and, and the entire team. Well, that gives us pause. <laughs> Save that comment for after the <laughs> Thank you so much, um, and not shocking. Thank you. Um, Loretta, uh, uh, are we all set with respect to your piece? We are, uh, we are, Chair, we are 
Good, it's complete. Thank you all very much. Thank you to chair and commissioners and thanks to the uh, PBC and Penn teams. Thank you. Thank you. We'll look forward to the continuing process. Thank you to the entire team, Monica, Andrew, Trooper Roger, it's so nice to see your faces. Please stay on. We're moving on now to item number uh, five, uh, Research and Responsible Gaming. Our Director of Research and Responsible Gaming, Mark Vanderlinden. We have a nice report. I am, it is 11.43. I should just check in with my fellow commissioners. Are you good to continue on or does anybody need a short break? Hearing none, we are going to continue. Oh, good. Okay. We're going to continue. There you are, Mark. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good, good morning. Um, I am joined uh, today virtually, obviously, um, by our co-principal investigators for the MAGIC study, the Massachusetts Gaming Impact Study, um, Dr. Rob Williams, who is faculty of health sciences at the University of Lethbridge in Lethbridge, Alberta. Um, as well as, as you're very familiar with uh, Dr. Rachel Volberg. Um, she is professor at the UMass Amherst School of Public Health and Health Sciences. Um, as usual, uh, Dr. Volberg and Williams prepared a, a pretty comprehensive and thorough uh, presentation for you. But um, also as usual, I, I wanna highlight and drive home just a few. Um, at the heart of what we're doing with this particular study is trying to understand um, gambling behavior. Um, specifically, we want to better understand gambling behavior of Massachusetts adult residents in order for us to, to more effectively prevent uh, gambling problems. And where gambling problems are pre uh, present or prevalent, um, how do we effectively uh, treat, treat, provide treatment for those individuals? Um, there's a lot of questions that we need to answer in order to, to effectively do that. So what are the predictors of problem gambling? How and why does problem gambling develop? Once an individual has developed a gambling problem, what is the course of the disorder? What does it, what does it look like? How does it manifest? Um, and finally, how do people recover from a gambling problem? What are the characteristics of somebody who is who effectively is able to, to remit or recover from gambling, a gambling problem? And what are the characteristics of an individual who continues to ongoing um, chronically struggle with gambling problem? These are the types of, of questions specifically that cohort studies are intended to, to answer. Um, the legislator had the, the foresight to require the Gaming Commission uh, to implement um, and oversee an ongoing research agenda. And included in this research agenda specifically was a study of the etiology or causes of problem gambling. So with this directive in 2013, the Mass Gaming Commission selected UMass to launch this cohort study. So this is a study that has been going on effectively since 2013. And we've, we've done uh, four waves of, of this study, examining gambling behavior of the same group of people um, over that, that course of time. So um, Dr. Williams will lead this presentation and he will describe to you what, what has changed um, among these individuals over the course of time. Obviously, um, a lot has changed in the nature of gambling and gambling availability um, since 2013, so it adds an extra layer of interest um, interest for, uh, for their study. Um, and again, let's bring it back to, we wanna understand gambling behavior so we can work with our partners uh, to develop effective treatment so that we as a gaming commission can um, develop effective prevention activities, um, specifically through the form of, of GameSense. This study is instrumental in, in doing that. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. Williams and Dr. Wolper. So I'm, I'm going to be uh, presenting the slides. Um, Rob, do you wanna do a little introduction before I share my screen? Sure, will do. So uh, thanks for the um, uh, introduction, Mark, and good morning, commissioners. Um, 
Yeah, today is a fairly short presentation. I'm not thinking more than 10, 15 minutes. And it's really a snapshot of the first four waves of the MAGIC study. That uh, in uh, um, the final wave of MAGIC, wave five, has com been completed. And we are in the midst of fairly comprehensive analysis of all five waves of the much more substantive report. And in the future, you'll have a, a much more comprehensive presentation about what we've learned in this study. Again, a good part of the purpose of this study was to identify um, predictors of problem gambling in Massachusetts and then operationalize those predictors into some public health uh, 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 policy. Um, what we're going to uh, talk about today is really a snapshot of, of two things. First is the um, the transitions of four different categories of, of gamblers over the waves, like is, is problem gambling a stable entity or an unstable entity? When you have uh, remission, is there a high rate of relapse? And the other thing is that this is the um, Massachusetts Gambling Impact Cohort Study. So it also provides a bit of a canary in coal mine in terms of whether the changes in gambling participation and problem gambling as it relates to the introduction of casinos to Massachusetts. So that's what this is about. And uh, so Rachel, if you could start that slide back. Here we go. Okay. All right, I'll move on to the next slide here. So a little bit of a little bit more information about magic. This is the first major cohort study of gambling in the United States. There have been a handful of other large scale studies in Canada, Sweden, Australia. Actually, Dr. Goldberg and myself and involved most of those. Um, so you might ask, well, what's the utility in, in doing one in the United States? Well, the time periods are different. All of the previous large scale studies were done about 10 years ago and things have changed in terms of gambling availability, et cetera. But the um, demography of Massachusetts is different from of these other countries. Not only is the demography different, but the uh, profile of prevention efforts uh, are unique to each jurisdiction. The availability of casino gambling is different in, in Massachusetts. So this is the only jurisdiction that uh, did a cohort study where there wasn't casino gambling available. It's also the only cohort study where uh, a major form of gambling was introduced in the midst of the cohort study. So it provides a, a better view on the, um, the impact of introducing casino gambling. So there are a lot of unique learnings of this particular study, which is, um, and, and so the findings will be um, uh, no doubt somewhat similar to the previous cohort studies, but I, we have no doubt there's going to be some unique findings for Massachusetts. Next slide. Four major research goals, with the two that are being addressed today in the box. The first is to monitor changes in prevalence of gambling and problem gambling over time that might identify impacts of Massachusetts casino introduction. The second is the term of the stability and course of the three types of gamblers, recreational gamblers, risk gamblers, problem gamblers. The third and arguably the most important is to use this information about the predictors of problem gambling onset, continuation, remission, and relapse for the purposes of developing an overarching ideological model, model of problem gambling that can be then used for research goal number four, which is to operationalize those above findings to optimize treatment and prevention of problem gambling in Massachusetts. We will find, <clears throat> no doubt, that there's a combination of endogenous, unmodifiable predictors, maybe gender, ethnicity, uh, et cetera. So the focus is really on the modifiable ones and how to um, change the course of those modifiable ones so as to decrease the future onset and incidence of, of problem gambling. Next slide. Um, this is the details of the four waves to date. Um, as 
as most people will know, wave one was actually uh, the baseline general population survey. When we got um, awarded a contract to do a prevalence, sorry, a cohort study, we realized that we had um, um, a good basis for recruiting people from the general population survey. So we identified uh, people from the general population survey with a sample enriched for people at risk for becoming problem gamblers and people who are already problem gamblers. So um, the bullet point there indicates that wave one was overselected for at risk characteristics, all problem gamblers, uh, all at risk gamblers, uh, people who gambled on a weekly basis, people who spent more than $1,200 in the past year on gambling and having military service. All of those are known risk factors. And so we wanted an enriched risk fact, uh, set of risk factors because it gives you more granularity in understanding the variables that cause some people to move in, some people to remit, some people not to move in. So um, the baseline general population survey had a 36.6% response rate. Um, we identified people from that uh, baseline survey who we wanted to recruit into the cohort. The cohort was formally established in wave two, and we had a surprisingly high response rate, 65.1% of the people we identified that we'd like to recruit. Again, everyone in the baseline general population survey had no awareness that we might um, uh, recruit them at a later point to a cohort study. So we're quite pleased to see that two thirds of people did agree to be in a multi-year cohort study. And then wave three and wave four, we have retention rates of the original 65% of people that we, that we recruited. Um, and so 81.1% retention by wave four is pretty good as cohort studies go. When you lose people from a cohort study, you potentially, the, the generalizability of your findings is potentially weakened. So when you have a very high retention rate with we do, as we do, you have confidence in the findings. Now, I also put the openings of the two casinos in there um, as a reminder when we look at the next few slides that uh, really the only venue that was open uh, in the first four ways was PPC in uh, 2015. Next slide. So again, the first set of findings uh, concerns the changes in prevalence of gambling and problem gambling within the cohort that might identify impacts of Massachusetts casino introduction. Next slide. And what this is, it's a complicated slide, but what it does is it plots the prevalence of gambling participation for each major type of gambling across the four waves. So the top line is actually traditional lottery. Um, and if you look at the, the legend there, it, it identifies what type of gambling is, is denoted by which, which line. Now, because of the large sample sizes, most of these changes, even the minor ones, are statistically significant. But um, um, a couple of general observations. One is that while there may be some changes, remember that PPC was opened after wave two and prior to wave three, that uh, there are not dramatic changes in the pattern of gambling behavior as a result of uh, this single venue opening. That said, there are a couple of notable changes that um, probably uh, one of which is almost certainly attributable to the introduction of PPC. So the red line with the numbers on is the most important one. And that is the uh, extent of the cohort that patronized out of state casinos. And you see uh, prior to any casinos in Massachusetts, you had 32% of people, stable from wave one to wave two. And then PPC opened, and there was a fairly dramatic uh, decrease to 21% in wave three and 19% in wave four. Now, um, uh, there may be other explanations for, for this, but um, it's one of the most dramatic changes that we see in this. And with the introduction of PPC, it's, it's plausibly, and we think almost certainly related to the creation of domestic uh, casino opportunities. And I mean, that's good news. I mean, a good part of the purpose of introducing casinos 
was repatriation of uh, uh, casino money that was going out of state. And the magic cohort provides evidence that that is happening in a significant way. Now, um, there are other changes there. I want to focus on the second bullet point, which is wave three increases in traditional lottery. So you notice that there's a change from about 70% to 75% wave two to wave three in traditional lottery. Now, I know there's been a concern in Massachusetts about the impact of additional type of gambling casino on, on uh, lottery products. And one thing you can say for sure to date with the magic findings is that there's been no cannibalization or decrease or negative impact really as a result of the casinos to date in wave four. We haven't analyzed wave five, which will include um, uh, MGM and, and, and the impact encore. But to date, we see no evidence of that. In fact, in wave three, there was a significant increase in patronization of traditional casino products. Now, when we drilled down into the data um, and looked at revenues uh, and looked at revenues for particular types of lottery products, it seemed that this is actually has nothing to do with PPC. It's more likely due to a fairly massive Powerball, Powerball jackpot in 2016, which always creates a lot of hoopla. And if more people who would normally buy a lottery ticket do buy lottery tickets. And so that's probably what the 2016 increase is. And again, it's not dramatic in any case. The other anomaly there is the purple line, and that is daily lottery. And we think that's totally artifactual. One of the complications we had in doing this cohort study is that the wave one and wave two were not intended to be cohort questionnaires. Wave one, again, was the baseline general population survey, and we're trying to ascertain the social and economic impacts of gambling in Massachusetts. And so it didn't have a comprehensive set of questions and variables pertaining to the etiology of problem gambling. And um, so we expanded the questionnaire in wave three and then kept it stable from wave three on. But um, some of those minor changes in question wordings um, uh, did produce some changes and we think uh, this was simply due to adding a couple of additional instances of what constituted um, a, a daily lottery and that more people recognize those and that more people um, then endorse that. Plus the fact that when you have an increase in Powerball participation, it tends to have a beneficial impact on other types of lottery um, related products and that's instant tickets and raffles. So anyways, that's probably the story with uh, lottery products and, and raffles. That there were significant but minor changes in bingo online gambling. Now online gambling has been increasing around the world uh, generally, but a much more comprehensive way of uh, ascertaining whether people are participating in online gambling was also a contributing factor to the increase in wave three. But anyways, the takeaway from this is that there definitely looks to be recapture of casino revenue as a function of the introduction of, introduction of PPC in 2015. Next slide. Equally important <clears throat> is the impact on problem gambling. People being, can be categorized in four groups, non-gamblers, recreational gamblers, at-risk gamblers, and problem gamblers. And we use the instrument that uses those categorizations. And what you see here is the percentage of people in the cohort in each of those categories across the all, all four waves. As you see, the overwhelming uh, membership in the cohort is recreational gamblers. And for the most part, that doesn't change much. We did see a bit of an uptick in wave three. And again, that's probably almost certainly due to more non-gamblers buying the Powerball uh, ticket and the changes in question wordings for the, the, um, the uh, uh, daily games, which uh, cause greater overall endorsement. Um, and, and so, again, the, the, um, the change in recreational gambling is really not meaningful, and to the extent it actually uh, has changed, it has more to do with Powerball, Jackpot, and the questions of wording. So when you have an increase in recreational gambling, you'll have a decrease in non-gambling, which is the black line. Um, the yellow line is at-risk gambling. Uh, at-risk gambling uh, 
sort of counterintuitively in wave four is significantly lower than wave one, 10.8% versus 12.8%. Um, again, not a meaningful difference, um, but it's always a good thing. At-risk gambling is really sort of subclinical gambling. These are people who have signs of problematic gambling, but not to the extent we, uh, we would categorize them as a problem gambler or having an addiction. Now, the most important line here is the red line, which is the percentage of the cohort that are problem gamblers. Now, remember, the cohort does not speak to population prevalence. We have an enriched sample, and so 3.8% of the cohort were problem gamblers in wave four, but that is not as much higher than the uh, population prevalence of problem gambling uh, at, at that time. The most important thing is there seems to be, and there is a statistically significant increase in wave four problem gambling, 3.8% from those earlier waves. Again, the magnitude is, is very small, but again, um, it's plausibly related to casino introduction in wave two and imminent casino introduction at the end of wave four. Um, an important thing to recognize about problem gambling is that it, the problem gambling is simply not due to the increase in availability that, as we'll see in subsequent slides, that Problem gambling is actually a very unstable entity and that um, people move in and out quite quickly. But that relapse is also quite high and relapse occurs with just reminders of, of gambling. And so all of the hoopla associated with um, the imminent opening of MGM plausibly might have also added to that uptick in wave four. That we did see increased chronicity from wave three to wave four fewer people remitting from wave three to wave four as normally would. And so um, anyways, that is a bit of concern. Wave five will be the more important figure. Next slide, please. So the second major topic is the individual stability of four categories of uh, people across all four waves. Next slide. Now this looks a bit confusing, so let me describe it. What we have here is 309 rows, with each row representing an individual, and this denotes the 309 people who are non-gamblers in wave one. By non-gambling, it means in the past year, they reported no lottery products, no raffle tickets, no gambling of any sort. And Wave two, wave three, wave four, each of those columns shows their status. Green being recreational gambling, yellow being at risk gambling, and red, which is almost imperceptible there, being problem gambling. So what you see is that the bulk of people who are non-gamblers, i.e. the white category, wave one, were also non-gamblers in wave two and the bulk of non-gamblers wave two or non-gamblers wave three. That said, there's a pretty significant movement. The majority of people who are non-gamblers wave one did become recreational gamblers at some point, which is fairly commonsensical because all it takes is to buy, I mean, most people who espouse to be non-gamblers still over the course of a few years, you'll, you'll buy a 50-50 um, raffle ticket or maybe uh, someone will buy you or you will buy a lottery ticket for someone else doesn't take much to move you into the recreational gambling category. So that's basically what happens with non-gamblers. Uh, but a good portion of those move back to non-gambling. Very, very few of these people move into at-risk gambling and even fewer to problem gambling. So it's a fairly stable category and the transitions that occur is really to recreational gambling. Next slide, please. Recreational gambling, this constitutes by far and away the largest portion of co a cohort. Now each line here actually represents 50 individuals. And the total graphic is to, is to convey a couple of points. One is that this is by far and away not only the largest category, recreational gambling, again, people tend to focus, especially researchers, on negative aspects of gambling, problem gambling, but we have to remind ourselves that the huge majority of people uh, who engage in gambling do it responsibly and 
that's what we characterize as recreational gambling, they are not only the majority, but that relatively few of these people transition to at risk or problem gambling. The large majority of recreational gamblers continue to be recreational gamblers at each, at each wave. A small portion transition into non-gambling and 19.4% um, uh, did transition into at-risk gambling at some point, and an even smaller percentage, 2.3%, became problem gamblers. So it's a very, the, the risk of problem gambling, if you're recreational gambling, is, is only 2.3% over four years. Um, so it's, it's very, very low. So this is a very stable category. Um, Moving to the next slide, please. At risk gambling, by contrast, so we're back to each line representing an individual with the 280 individuals who were um, at risk gamblers at wave one, their trajectory over the four waves being, being plotted. So in contrast, recreational gambling, at risk gambling is the most unstable. So the minority of people who had problematic levels, but non-clinical levels of gambling behavior in wave one um, were still having subclinical levels of, of gambling behavior in wave two. Uh, most of those people actually transitioned to recreational gambling. And so that's generally what you see there. A good portion of people at, in the at-risk category move to recreational gambling. And even though we call it at-risk gambling, um, we certainly see that um, the red shows, again, that 16.4% of people in wave one became problem gamblers at some point back, at, at, in some point in the subsequent three waves. So you're still at much higher risk than if you were a recreational gambler, let alone a non-gambler. But the huge majority of these people actually transition back to recreational gambler. And what this indicates is that when most people start having trouble with a behavior, whether it's substances or any excess of any sort of behavior, once you get your fingers burnt, you remit and you change your behavior. You, um, you rethink what you're doing and you change. It's only the minority who persevere, persist, and, and to get into trouble. So that's, that's a good thing, and that's something to to remind us that, the, the, again, the, the large majority of people who have initial troubles actually sort them out on their own. Next slide, please. The final and probably the most important slide here is the stability of problem gambling. So this is a little more complicated slide in that in addition to showing the trajectory of uh, everyone at wave one, um, who was a problem gambler in the subsequent three waves. I've plotted the trajectory of anyone who was a problem gambler in any of the waves. So it's a little more complicated. But the first overriding thing that you'll see from this is that this is a remarkably unstable entity. It's more stable than risk gambling, but still um, fairly unstable. That um, the modal duration of problem gambling is only one year. And, and that's counterintuitive to a lot of people who, who um, have a sense that addictions that probably include gambling addiction are more chronic than they actually uh, are, are, are chronic. And um, we think problem gambling is different in some respects. Now, a couple, couple of points here. One is that the modal duration is actually only one year. So that seems more unstable than other sorts of uh, um, addictions. But you'll see that the people who did remit um, in the subsequent wave three and wave four, um, there's fairly high rates of relapse. So 25% um, of people who had recovered by wave two had relapsed by wave three or wave four. The longer term relapse is unknown, going to be, but it's gonna be much higher. We'll have a, better picture of the relapse rate in, um, uh, after we look at wave five. And so problem gambling is still chronic in the sense that, I mean, it's, it's a truism of all addictions, that once you develop an addiction, whether it's cigarette smoking or 
or um, alcohol, you're always at much higher risk for continuation and relapse. And that's also the case for gambling addiction. Um, that said, the remission rate may be higher than other addictions in that if you are a substance abuser, let's say you have a problem with alcohol, you can sustain that for multiple years because, um, at least from a financial perspective, because it doesn't have the same impact on you as if you're a problem gambler. Problem gamblers, a good portion of those are going to run into financial difficulties and that might force them to remit. So we think the remission rate is actually higher, but the ultimate um, relapse rate may not be any different from other addictions. But so that's the picture we're, we're finding here. But that's good news from a prevention perspective because it means that there's lots of people remitting on their own. I mean, um, we don't have this sort of detail in here. We'll contain it in the final report and our final presentation to a greater extent. But um, um, only minority of these people remitted because they accessed treatment. Most of these people did it on their own. And so one of the, um, one of the important findings here is that most people can do it on their own and we need to have things that will facilitate this self-help type of strategy. Um, but we'll also be able to look at the role of treatment in maybe accentuating that rem remission rate and continuation of remission over, over a, a long period of time. But that's not part of this. At this point, all we really want to show is the remarkable instability of problem gambling, but the high relapse rate. And I think that's it. Rachel, I'm going to move to the final slide. Yeah, so that's all I have. And both Rachel and I are uh, keen to take any questions you might have. Uh, if we could uh, perhaps uh, have the slide disappear so that we can see faces. It's easier for me to navigate there. Thank you, Rachel. Um, questions for uh, Dr. Williams and for Dr. Volver. Enrique, um, uh, Commissioner Cameron, okay. Sure, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I was interested in the, um, well, first of all, I think overall this, is pretty good news, uh, it would seem to me. Um, in particular, that people are able to recognize the issue and move back to a recreational level. Um, you did speak about this, uh, Dr. Williams, uh, moving back, so they get burned and then they change their behavior. So that seemed interesting to me. And do you know if that is, um, similar in other jurisdictions or nobody has this kind of research so far? This, um, this particular finding about the instability of problem gambling and the fact that most people who are at risk gamblers go back to recreational gambling is very similar to what has been found in Canada, Australia, and Sweden. So it's a consistent finding, which is, which is good. So it says that Massachusetts is very similar to other jurisdictions around the world. So that's a universal finding. Thank you. Other questions? If I may um, just. Uh, I just okay. want to make sure, um, Mark, if Commissioner Zuniga, are you on? I just want to make sure you have, if you are muted, now you're not. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I realized I was, uh, I was muted. So um, I did have a question um, uh, for Rob. If we can go to anyone, perhaps one of the slides uh, where you're looking at the uh, uh, problem gambling. Um, I guess it's a, the, yeah, the, the last slide before the questions. Um, what I'm most uh, intrigued by are the number of people who go from recreational mm -hmm. gambler all the way to problem gambling and then go back to rec to recreational gambling. In other words, they, they, they seem to hop over a category that is in, in between. Are there any uh, characteristics that, uh, that you're ascertaining from uh, those kinds of people? 
Yeah, that's an interesting observation. We've noticed it as well. And so it, the sort of lore around addictions is it's a gradual sort of thing, but they're actually several trajectories. There's some people who very rapidly move into it and other people it takes, it takes years. And so they're, um, I'm gonna, we haven't analyzed that in detail um, yet. That's for a final report. But we know those differences exist. And there tend to be, uh, in other research, demographic differences that suggest that. And so one of the things that have been found in other research is that female problem gamblers tend to have a more rapid trajectory than males, which tends to be more gradual. Um, but I'm sure there's other characteristics, and um, but um, we'll be able to identify those different trajectories in, in the final report. Yeah, I, l I look forward to that. I remember from a prior report that uh, you started to identify the protective factors and the risk factors um, between these, uh, some of these categories. And I think that's what, uh, what ultimately provides a lot of great information to, uh, you know, to people like us and others at DPH, for example, to develop, uh, pr you know, prevention and messages and, uh, and other uh, kinds of services. Yeah, I mean, to my mind, there's three really important things from that slide in, these stu in this study. One is, what are, the what are the variables that predict onset in the first place? Mm -hmm. And are there demographic differences in what those variables are? The second is, what differentiates chronicity? Like, there's still like a quarter of people who are chronic problem gamblers weren't able to remit across those waves versus uh, remission. And to what extent does formal treatment play a role in that? We already know that the minority of people are accessing formal treatment. So we know that um, people using their own resources is a very powerful weapon. And especially us, uh, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, but we don't give enough credit to people's own resources in, in um, changing their behavior. And we need to provide them with more tools to accentuate that. So determining um, the, determining what it is, what variables differentiated people who continued versus remitted. I know in the other longitudinal research we've done in other countries, it's the presence of comorbidities. So people with mental health problems, major depression in particular, were more likely to be chronic in the next wave versus remit. And so one of the implications of that from um, a treatment perspective is that if you deal with the mental health comorbidities, that's going to have a prophylactic effect on uh, problem gambling, even though that might not be the focus of your, of, uh, 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 of your, your intervention. Um, yeah, so there's, there's lots of really important and interesting um, policy relevant findings that will derive from this. And we hope to make it as specific and as demographically specific as, as we can. Yeah, that builds on, on the question I had. I thought it was fascinating to hear that just the buzz of the introduction of play into a jurisdiction, the anticipation was the word you used, doctor, um, can, can be a trigger. And so I'm, but just now I'm also hearing you say, in terms of the shift of the problem gambler, if it's an organic uh, medical need, mental health um, issue for the, the, um, the gambler, then it's not necessarily always external triggers or does that just compound it? And I'm thinking of things like advertising and marketing, aggressive um, uh, commercial intervention, I guess um, I'm wondering if, if it's because, uh, you know, what, what are the, the likely tr triggers uh, when you say anticipation? It's really, um, it's really no different from any addiction. If you're, a, if you're a smoker who's given up, then going back to the vacation property where you always smoked or you always had a smoke when you had a drink at the, at the lounge or people you're with, um, or 
advertisements on TV. We don't have much of it. We don't have any of those anymore. But any of those things, anything that was associated with behavior becomes a, a trigger. And that trigger causes craving. If your own internal resources are low ebb because you've got these comorbidities like depression and you just don't have the resolve to um, stay the course, then you're more likely for those triggers to move you in there. But so, so and, people with so, mental health problems, these triggers, they're, you know, they're able to ignore them. People with other burdens have less resources to uh, ignore them. And if they don't have access, as you said, you know, it may not even be access, just the anticipation. Um, are you, there's a lot of gambling outlets. And I know we've talked about, I think in the last presentation, which that it, that it matters what the type of, of gambling outlets, but in this case where the casinos weren't even built yet, but you suggest that the anticipation could be a trigger, would they then, likely go for underground casino play or illegal options or would they go for more lottery play which would be have been legal problem gamblers tend to be fairly diverse okay. they are not exclusively casino gamblers exclusively sports bettors they tend to um, be involved in lots of different types and so um, uh, the, all of the above so they're okay. more likely to patronize legal outlets, they're more likely to buy lottery tickets, they're more likely to do all of these things. So just um, the buzz of when casinos were coming, I think that's fascinating, could trigger them to start playing the, the lottery more or go to bingo more. Okay. But to, to put a finer edge on this, you gotta remember that the change is only 3.1 to 3.8%, and this is an enriched sample. If we hearken back to our, our results on the social and economic impacts of gambling you know, you know, in, um, in, in Massachusetts study, if you recall, one of the important results of that was the introduction of PPC had no measurable impact on the population prevalence of problem gambling um, in either the state or the uh, Plainville host and surrounding communities. And so, um, we have no doubt that the hoopla, advertising, reminders, talk about casino gambling has probably increased chronicity in a small subset of problem gamblers, if that information wasn't there, who might have remitted. But in the grand scale of things, it's, no, it's a very small segment of the population that we haven't seen a dramatic um, increase in problem gambling in the state. Uh, and I mean, this is more for the, the Sigma study in wave five, right. but yeah, um, um, there's a lot of evidence that Massachusetts residents are fairly inoculated and inured to the impacts of casino gambling because of the ready availability in adjoining states. And so the ultimate negative impacts to problem gambling may are likely not going to be as dramatic as it would be in a jurisdiction that had no no casino gambling available uh, in, in neighboring jurisdictions. Thank you. Other questions or comments, Mark? Do you want to chime in? Um, <laughs> I can't remember what I was going to say earlier, but I would just <laughs> like to say, um, I you know I do find it. Um, encouraging that there there is movement um, between uh, especially problem and at-risk gamblers and that um, our goal really is to to when we're thinking about the game sense program is to target those individuals specifically and what can we do to move them down that continuum and if we know that there's there is a lot of movement there that it it is encouraging to know that what can we do to nudge them, nudge them down that continuum? Or for problem gamblers, what can we do to provide them with, with, um, with an outlet to, to get to, um, to help? And if it's a voluntary self-exclusion program specifically, and we think about the different um, time options that, that are there, 
it's a specific timeout that, that we can we can offer in individuals. I think that um, overall the magic study has has been encouraging um, in terms of our understanding of gambling behavior and the interventions that um, we try to tailor for uh, specific gambling types. So we'll save that last slide. <laughs> it is very, it is a very good visual. Fascinating. And commissioners, any further questions? This is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still playing catch up on the cohort uh, study, although I was aware of it because of, of my earlier work and when I met Mark and, and the cohort was being formed. And so for me, this, I'm, I'm catching up, but it's just fascinating to see how it's come uh, full circle. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any further, any further questions? Mark, are you all set? I'm all set, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Moving on to um, community mitigation. We have an update on one matter that had been suspended for further review. So we have uh, Joe Delaney and uh, of course, Mary Thurlow chiming in as well. There she is, thank you. Uh, great, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioners. Um, for your uh, consideration today is the West Springfield uh, Police and Fire Community Mitigation Fund application. Um, as you may recall, we discussed this application at some length on June 25th, and we did not come to a resolution at that point. Um, in the meantime, we gathered some additional information uh, from West Springfield, which uh, was included in your packets. We had a few additional questions for them. Um, so the remaining items that needed to be addressed on this were whether or not, uh, or whether these funds would be considered uh, as supplementing or supplanting existing funds. And the second item was whether the amount of the request is appropriate considering uh, the cost of the impact. So with respect to the first item, the supplement versus supplant argument, I'm not sure we can ever come to a perfect answer on this, but um, I think you know over the last month we've kind of come around to the idea that we consider this uh, supplementing rather than supplanting. And so you know in West Springfield's case, they're losing um, federal funding, federal grant funding, and they are asking us to supplement that pool of funding, um, which seems to be a reasonable argument. Now, when you look at the term supplanting funds, it's more like a community asking for funds to take the place of existing funds so that they could use that money somewhere else. And that is certainly not what's happening here in this case. So based on this, we are recommending that the, con the commission consider this uh, supplementing existing funds. So now with respect to the second item, which is the appropriateness of the request, the requested amount, um, Absent having a completed look back study, uh, it's difficult for us to ascertain what the exact cost of the impact is. Now, we do know what the cost associated with the additional staff that West Springfield added, but that does not necessarily correlate with the cost of the impact itself. Now, of course, the completion of the look back study is not the responsibility of West Springfield, but it is but the responsibility of MGM. So, uh, you know, we don't want to unnecessarily withhold money from West Springfield because that study hasn't been completed. Um, and also what we do know is that the request that they're making, which is $200,000, um, only makes up about 19% of the cost of this additional personnel that they added. They have estimated that for uh, 2021, the total cost of the the 16 personnel that they added to fire and police is about $1.06 million for 2021. So, you know, in order to move this forward, we are recommending that the commission make a one-time grant in the amount of $200,000 uh, with the understanding that uh, no further grants will be made for these uses 
unless the look back study clearly identifies the cost of the impact and that the cumulative impacts on West Springfield exceed the amount of money that is um, received under the surrounding community agreement, which right now is 375,000 that, uh, that West Springfield receives. And with that, I will uh, open it up to questions. Any questions for Joe? Just first off on background, any reminders needed with respect to the original application? Okay. I know that uh, most of us have had the benefit also of a, a two by two briefings. Commissioner O'Brien, do you wanna chime in on this request? No, I, I did benefit from the briefing the other day and I was leaning toward this resolution uh, in the June meeting in terms of looking at supplanting versus supplementing. <clears throat> and I do think that we, um, we had talked about that, not dissuading people also from finding other funding sources, et cetera, which I think the distinction that Joe points out of taking funding to then go take you know, municipal resources for something completely unrelated, um, that's not what this is. And so I think that the recommendation that they're making today is consistent with the questions that we had the last time. Um, I think it's consistent with the rules. Um, uh, Joe, I don't know if you wanted to get into any more. You, you touched a little bit on the fact that there's a limit to some of the information we have, but um, I don't know if any, I was satisfied with the questions that we had last time that they were sufficiently answered by the team, but I don't know if anyone else has questions. Yeah, I think, I, to I think me, this is accurate. Yeah, I think that the, the questions that, you know, that we, we posed to them, they certainly gave us good answers to those questions, but still those answers didn't really sort of settle that issue of supplement versus supplant because they're, as like I said, they're real, it's really kind of a, a bit of a gray area that we have to that we have to weigh in on. Commissioner uh, Cameron. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I also agree with the um, with the recommendation of uh, the working group here. Um, without the look look back look back study, there is no way to tell for sure about the impacts. Um, but I do think they did make a good faith effort to answer the additional questions. Um, they know that we are looking at these matters closely. Um, and the 19% only of the existing costs, I think, was um, an important piece of this as well. So they are not looking to um, cover a huge portion of this. So it's still significant, but I, I do agree with the recommendation that. Um, we allow a one-time opportunity because it was not their responsibility to conduct the look back study. And um, you know, there are reasons why it wasn't completed. So I, I, I agree with the team's assessment. Other comments, questions? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I, I also agree with the, with the team's recommendation um, and you know, certainly follows the rules of the program. Um, Joe, just for some clarification, uh, in your conversations with the city of West Springfield, that what they receive now from MGM is directed towards uh, some of their public safety needs, the 375,000 in the surrounding community agreement. Yeah, they indicated to us that all of the money that they receive from the surrounding community agreement goes directly toward public safety. Okay. And and I think, and, and Commissioner Cameron will correct me, but I think in, in some of the early work that we've had from Mr. Uh, Christopher Bruce, there, there are some signs or some indications of uh, the presence of MGM impacting public safety in West Springfield. So, um, you know, I, I think, think, Joe, to your, your final determination, this kind of period we find ourselves in where the, uh, the look back study hasn't been completed and, you know, kind of the ongoing needs of the city of West Springfield, I, I think your recommendation makes sense. Uh, uh, a one-year agreement and, uh, you know, hopefully the, the look back study can be reviewed and MGM and West Springfield can work out any issues that they need to, but I, I think this is being responsive. And again, it's 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 19% uh, of 
of the overall cost of these additional public safety employees that they brought on, I, I think sounds reasonable. Hearing no further comments, do um, we do need to vote on this, correct, today? Yes, there should be a motion in, uh, in your packet. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I move that the commission issue a one-time only grant in the amount of 200000 to West Springfield for public safety operating costs as discussed here today and in accordance with the recommendations outlined in the July um, 27, 2020 memo included in the commissioner's packet. Second. Any further questions or edits needed? Okay. Hearing none, Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. And I vote yes, 5 0, Shar. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Joe and Mary, and thank you for the briefings beforehand. This all seemed like the, the most reasonable and, and, a, and a fair resolution, uh, particularly given our challenges right now. So thank you. Moving thank on you. to, thank you so much. Moving on to um, item number seven. Do any of my fellow commissioners have an update for today? Commissioner Zuniga, is your update that you want to go back on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's not a very long update. Let's just put it that way. But uh, uh, no, no, thank you. Um, all set. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, great. All right. Hearing none, um, I have no further business that needs to be addressed. So, do we have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stevens. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, and the, of course, the uh, all of us say thank you to the entire team. This was a lot of work. Uh, very great preparation. Put us in a very um, informed position for today's meeting. So we appreciate um, everyone's input, the entire team that's here, and to all stay, stay safe and well, and try to uh, remember that it's important to breathe. And take a little bit of time during this um, very, very busy work um, period for all of us. So thank you, I, I vote yes. Five zero, meeting adjourned.